We are fragile echoes and hovering memories of the old, young, and unborn who never lived to fulfill fate's existence. I was only a child when I first heard them whisper stories of suffering, sorrow, and death. Six million souls How gone not forgotten I'm a child of a survivor The scars are there, the fears, the mistrusts, the actual um, I still have trouble with uniforms, <laughs> even if it's a policeman directing traffic. What happened to the Jews during the 12-year reign of the Nazis was so horrific, especially in a modern era, that a new term to describe it had to be invented. When we confront the charged moral questions of existence of violence, anti-Semitism, genocidal threats, racism and discrimination, we realize that these concepts do not belong to the past centuries. They are still with us today. We had a little flicker of hope, saying if we came out from Auschwitz alive, maybe, maybe somehow there will be a miracle will happen now and we might be able to survive. But coming to uh, Stutthof was not much better than Auschwitz although there were no gazing or cremating, but the life, the conditions there were so miserable, so bad, that people were falling like flies. You know what it's like to hear the cry of six million Jews. childhood. I never was afraid until I started going to school where one day at recess one of the little girls called me a dirty Jew. I was shocked. I was stunned. I remember I came home crying and asking my mom how could she call me a dirty Jew? I took a shower this morning. We were an obstacle to Poland. An obstacle because we were also called uh, kikes, uh, heaps, uh, shylocks, uh, we were um, uh, the dogs, the uh, Satan's children, and everything under, this, under the sun, we were labeled uh, as the uh, Christ killers, and we were the ones who were against Christ. But this is how we lived in Poland with people, side, door by door, side by side, and these same people told on us where we were hiding. But Jews were not the only victims of the Nazis and their collaborators, who massacred all they deemed racially or ideologically inferior. The total Nazi death count has been estimated by genocide scholars to number nearly 21 million people. They included millions of gypsies, homosexual men, Jehovah's Witnesses, the handicapped, including German handicap, certain Slavic citizens, prisoners of war, political dissidents, and anyone who dared to resist. My father was in that corridor, and when some German soldiers came and started to move the stuff to see what there was behind it, he very quickly pushed, uh, I think, a ruble or two rubles into the hand of that soldier. The soldier clasped what he thought was really something of great value, put it in his pocket and kept on moving. And this is how I survived. is I. 
that is the adornment we forge whenever we shackle our human freedom. I is an eagle's feather trampled beneath final solution. I is the shamed thighs of all raped women demanding the rapist's death as my retribution. Blues man, I is a black boot stepping, goose stepping, stomping down the doors of scapegoats. Blues man, the screaming stream of ash that blackened the skies above Bergen Belsen, Dachau, and Auschwitz. I is the knocking, I is the door, I is that voice both harsh and warm. I is the last bit of will your pain cannot kill, that fine thread of life in life's tapestry of storms. I sit to the jangling discord of my sonata and hear within its pale blue murmuring this thin cry of hope. Listen to the single flower fighting while sighing her way through the cracks of concrete, and hear I split wind and cheat death with this breath of human survival. I is the blues, man. The blues, man, is I. I and my two brothers were placed in the camp and assigned to to work. It was toilets. I was assigned to canal arnicus and that was meaning cleaning the toilets. We worked some in the weaving factory and some unloading coals. We knew Martin Goldberg who was making the list. He actually was a friend of my father and he and his wife and sister shared our tiny room in the ghetto. And so he put my mother and me on the list. And um, we went to work for Oscar Schindler. So we were taken away out of hell. We were grabbed away from a sadistic, brutal murderer. And we went to Amalia, which was heaven. How do we ever begin to mourn the generations never to be born? A leader, a hero, an heir to a nation, a builder, an artist, a healer, a clown. The cures undiscovered, the music unwritten, all the dreams undreamt or shattered or broken, unimagined treasure, the losses unmeasured, unwept for, unspoken. There was a storm on the ocean, and we see the death for our eyes. Finally, you know, with God's will, six days on the ocean, Without bread, without nothing, the lies was eating us up. So my parents decided they would take a chance. What they did is they timed the guards that were guarding the, the barbed wire that was surrounding the ghetto so that they would be able to go to the barbed wire and dig a hole the size of a six-year-old so I could escape. They managed to do that at the risk of their lives, of course. And um, the miracle is that when the time came for me to do it, and they again timed the guards and the dogs and the searchlights, I was actually able to crawl under that barbed wire and be here with you today. And then there was an order from Himmler that no inmates of, from concentration camps should fall in the Allied's hands. They all had to be destroyed. And so we were put on the dead march. I slipped into the ditch alongside the road, lying face down in the snow, motionless. There was a zealous guard who did shoot me, but maybe because of the dark, he shot me under the arm. The bullet got stuck in a rib and the, the blood spread over the snow, which was good because uh, nobody else attempted to waste the bullet for somebody who lost that much blood. The Russians came and liberated us. And all of a sudden, I did not have to be afraid. However, we were afraid of something else. We were women, and the Russians were starved for sex. And of course, we were young. And we were afraid of them. Not afraid of being Jewish, but afraid of being 
violated by the Russians. Folk dancing purifies me, cures me of my sadness, cures me of, of depression. Folk dancers have no prejudices. They embrace everybody, whoever wants to dance, just comes and dance. That was 1945, already 1946, when we came to Poland. They knock on the door, they open. We don't need Jewish people anymore. If you are not running away tomorrow, we will kill you, baby. My mom and I were saved and we were supposed to go back to our home where we used to live before, but when we came there, the Ukrainians didn't want to give back our property, so they started killing the people. We finally got out of the camp, and we saw soldiers, and there came a soldier, <laughs> one soldier on a tank, and he jumped off the tank, He jumped off the tank and he gave me a, a little food that he was eating out of a can. So I, I just took a little bit with my fingers and I put it in my mouth and I gave it to my brother. And then I <laughs> fell down. I fell down to his feet and I kissed his boots. And he tried to pick me up. And. Uh, he gave me a flag, a flag, 48 star. I did not know it was a flag. I thought it was a handkerchief because I was crying to wipe off my tears. Later on, after he disappeared over the horizon, I saw a flag. When the Americans came, they brought the flag to the Dachau camp like they brought the flag to all the other places where they went. I was, uh, <laughs> I was saying that uh, I must go to America, where these people are coming from. Such compassionate people, such sensitive people, but yet they knew how to shoot and they knew how to be rough and tough. How did they, how were they like that? How, how did they manage to get like that? There were three prisoners of war in that camp. And one was black, one was British, two were American. And as soon as the army, liberating army, came in, they put uniforms on these prisoners of war. And I honor all liberators with that poem, My Black Messiah. A black GI stood by the door. I never saw a black before. He'll set me free before I die, I thought. He must be the Messiah. A black Messiah came for me. He stared with eyes that didn't see. He never heard a single word which hung absurd upon my tongue. And then he simply froze in place. The shock, the horror on his face, he didn't weep, he didn't cry, but deep within his gentle eyes, a flood of devastating pain, his innocence forever slain. But there's a special bond we share, which has grown strong because we dare to live, to hope, to smile, and yet we vow not ever to forget. They put me in a jeep and we went to the area that mass grave, um, digged up the bodies, made uh, the German people from the villages come out and dig out the dig out the bodies. They ordered every person from the village to bring a white sheet that was laid out at the edge near the grave, and they were ordered to take out the bodies and laid out on the white sheets and then people from all the nearby villages were ordered out to walk by and see what they did to the people.
Colonel Sparks, the battalion commander, his lead elements were on tanks, and they had already passed the town of Dachau when he got this order. So he took his reserve company, who was walking, he reconned the site, found the back gate by going over a railroad siding. And the first thing they came across were 39 boxcars of dead bodies. These uh, inmates at Buchenwald had been loaded on these trains. Eight trains, about 40 cars in each train, roughly four, three to 4,000 inmates from Buchenwald. One train per day for eight days, and the last train was loaded on the 9th of April, and the camp Buchenwald was liberated on the 11th. That's how close they came to interrupting this, moving these inmates out. We were able to find the graves of my mother's grandparents who died in the Lodge Ghetto in 1941 and 1942. We placed headstones. There are people today who want to deny that the Holocaust existed or that they uh, may have died from disease or from malnutrition or something. We saw it. We were witnesses to this. General Eisenhower made a very strong point that at some point in the future people will deny it. It has to be remembered so that it doesn't happen again, not only to Jews, but to any people who are uh, suffering from genocide. You know, the Bible talks about um, the evil that men do will, go, will continue for four generations, uh, whereas God's good goes, lasts for a thousand generations. And, and you can see that because it's four generations till your grandfather or great-grandfather or, gr or, or grandparents uh, no longer have, an, have a direct impact on you. And so things that affect someone last to his progeny and, and the progeny afterwards. And, and, I, and I see that in my own parents and how that's affected me and, and in how my children still relate to the experience. As the son of a Holocaust survivor, my sister and I learned at a very early age the importance of um, understanding uh, what it means to be uh, humane, uh, what it means to be caring, what it means to uh, value the most needy among, among us in society. Uh, those were values that were passed to me. Many other values as well, but that probably is what led me into um, choosing a career uh, where I help those who are most uh, vulnerable, help those who are most needy. This is, uh, this is the lesson that my sister and I were taught. Uh, we both have been very involved um, in, uh, in public service and, uh, and it's, it's no wonder. Those are the lessons that we've received. Their stories of life I caught all their tears They felt like they died So I buried their blues their pain My heart is so heavy I'm a child of the survivor And the sorrow will rise Never again means never again for anybody that we should all work for the saving of lives of any nation, any tribe, any group. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, there was a silence that came across the world. It is that silence that has intrigued me. You want to learn your family's experience, roots and identities. Know where you come from, how it all affected you. With this understanding, I have found that people then come together. The people that were killed 
were individual people that each one had a value and a life that was important that was taken away from them. And it's very important that the world never forget, so hopefully it will never happen again. The Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies was started about a decade ago by Dr. Deborah Dwork, who is a historian and the director of the center. The original idea behind it was to establish the Center for the Study of the Holocaust. But soon the program was expanded, its mandate was expanded to include other genocides in general and the Armenian genocide in particular. After 17 tribes, the Ottomans took over Anatolia piece by piece. They had forced the minorities that included Jews, Greeks, Assyrians, all as second-class citizens. They were never first-class citizens, never. If a person was Armenian, they had to wear red to identify by their clothing. If they were walking on a path and a Turkish person was walking, they had to step aside, give the path to these people, then go on. They couldn't ride a horse. They were not allowed to be in military service, and they were taxed twice as much than the Turks. Germans, they called the Armenians vermin. Now, if you look in history, the Nazis, they called the Jews vermin. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Same training, same vision. I constantly go through my life with a, almost like a feeling that I have a fire burning within me because I feel that all of the institutions, all of the families, all of Judaism was destroyed in Poland and in the Holocaust. Hardly anything was left. Warsaw alone used to have two to three hundred thousand religious Jews. Today there are 40 Orthodox Jews in all of Warsaw. Truly a Holocaust. And I feel that it's because of the sacrifices of the prior generation, my parents' generation, that have taught me that we have to do everything we can to rebuild our institutions and rebuild Judaism to make it even bigger and better than it was in the past. We could not believe what we were seeing. The still burning bodies were strewn about with their scorched, striped clothing. My mind was numb, and all I could think of was that our chaplain was not a Jew, and someone has got to say Kaddish. On my left were the poor smoldering souls on the ground in front of the huts. Not one was alive, and on my right the piles of starved to death dehumanized skeletal bones awaiting the boxcars to take them to the ovens in Dachau. And so, as I walked from hut to hut, I began to dove in Kaddish. Yehesh me rabba me vorach li olobo me ol mayo. Is porach vi stabach vi spoar vi stromam vi snase. Vi isadar vi salevi salol shebe de kucho brichu. Le elom in kobir hosa vi siroso tush me hosa vene chemoso da miron mi olbo vi bru obey. Yehesh loma rabba min shemayo. Vehaim alenu vi alko israel vi bru obey. O se shalom bi bromov hu ya se shalom. Alenu vi alko israel. Or I used to say, never again, 30 years ago perhaps, and I don't do that anymore because we have not learned enough from this history. 
We are repeating the same horrors. We are repeating genocide, and I am very upset. On the other hand, if we didn't do what we're doing, it might even be worse. I want to live in a world where there are no more wars and there will never be a Holocaust again, where everyone gets along. You cannot just sit by when you see injustice done. And I see from young people, more and more people, I see children and young people now um, trying to uh, run bake sales or car washes to raise money for their food because but we thought that we would be the last to witness atrocities and ethnic cleansing. It didn't happen. The world did not learn anything. This film is a portrait of the ongoing legacies of those still among us, those without even the graves of loved ones to visit those who courageously continue to live their best within the walls and chains of the stark, unforgiving past. Their stories must be told. Their histories must never be forgotten. As genocide continues in our modern world, may the lessons of the Holocaust, the memory of its victims, and the bravery of its survivors and witnesses teach us to always strive toward the achievement of peaceful human coexistence. Give again to give We're here